everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me here today, SciViz NYC, and special thanks to Amanda and Jen for inviting me. Um, so my name is Julia Buntain, and I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of SciArt Center and Magazine, which I'll talk a little bit about later. I'm also a neuroscience-based artist and the innovator in residence at Rutgers University. Um, but today I'm here to talk with you about visualizing science through illustration and art and how visualization acts as a connecting bridge between art and science, a bridge we desperately need in today in our ever specialized, ever divided culture. So my last slide, just so you can see it again, is an image um, of Brainbow, which was a visualization method uh, born out of Harvard. This method visualizes individual neurons to better study their architecture and structure. Um, it was created by a very advanced science, very advanced imaging. But as you well know, our visualization of science actually began a long time ago, and we've seen a lot of that today already. Um, but it began with the materials of art, not with science. It began with pen, pencil, and paper. Um, so this sketch, which you probably recognize, is by Leonardo da Vinci in his cross-disciplinary search for the patterns and forces behind the movement of flowing water, he has a number of drawings like this, which are still referenced today in the study of fluid dynamics. Another cross-disciplinary great is Santiago Ramon y Cajal. Uh, he's also known as the father of modern neuroscience and happened to be adept at drawing. Um, it was a boyhood passion of his. So through the act of drawing, Ramoni Cajal was the first to document the complexity of the neuron as viewed under the microscope. And these drawings are as relevant as they were, um, as in the 19th century when they were made. Our computer models have actually only recently caught up to the level of detail and complexity and subtlety of form that he achieves here. And of course, the infamous example of John Gould's drawings of Darwin's finches, which elucidated the differences between species and was integral in Darwin's conceptualization of evolution as natural selection. John Gould was an ornithologist and illustrator. It used to be the case that to be a scientist, you had to be a little bit of an artist as well, because how else could you share your findings? Similarly, these glassworks were created by the Blaschkas, who were a father and son team in the late 1800s. They were originally created to serve as a scientific and educational tool, immortalizing sea creatures for study. Here, the material of glass expertly captures the movement, opacity, and fragility of these ocean inhabitants, which could otherwise, at the time, not be properly preserved for long-term study. And the Blaschkas have hundreds of these pieces. These are only just four of my favorites. Um, Today, these works are celebrated as art. They were recently on display in the Corning Museum of Glass. These, in the past few examples, they're striking for, for their superb artistry, despite the fact that they were made for science. Um, and this point kind of exemplifies that it's the beauty of the, na the natural world that really connects art and science, and often, like here, makes the boundary between art and science seem kind of arbitrary. So we've already heard from James Gurney today, um, <laughs> but I had to include his work because uh, he's been really important in visualizing science and engaging people of all ages in science. Gurney's work gives us an avenue to intellectually and emotionally connect to a time and place which we wouldn't have access to otherwise. He does this through a narrative. Here we're dropped in the middle of a complex chase scene and we can literally feel the terror that's being inflicted on these poor small dinosaurs. I don't know what species they are. Some of you probably do. <laughs> this is another piece of his. Uh, this is a site rarely seen, would be rarely seen in person, but we, through visualization we can capture things which aren't seen or aren't mostly seen. Cartoon artist Katie McKissick, who is also known as Beatrice the Biologist, makes science relatable and funny through her anthropomorphic cartoons. I'm glad you guys are laughing. You're definitely supposed to. Um, I love this one. She has hundreds of these cartoons, if not thousands. Um, she gives characters to something like organelles, makes them kind of uh, have this personality that embodies their function. Um, this is another piece of hers. She explains the different states of matter in a comprehensible, relatable way. 
most would agree this is a much better way to explain than, <laughs> here's the laugh, <laughs> This is a much better way to explain states of batter than the dry paragraphs we get in middle school textbooks, which for me as a young kid definitely did not resonate, but this really does. <laughs> um, so another place that we can't access, uh, artist Jonathan Wells shows us what lies beneath the surface of the planet. Here we have his piece, Minneapolis St. Paul. So this is the bedrock and under of Minneapolis St. Paul area. Wells is a trained geologist and professional photographer. He combines his research and knowledge of geology with photography, and he calls his pieces photogeologic composites to show what lies below our feet. Basically, he has photos of what the bedrock looks like. He has research into what colors rocks would be and what their composite is, and he combines the photographs with archival, um, research and his own research, so it's really a collaboration between multiple disciplines to make his artworks. And these are pretty large scale too. This is probably a bit larger than in real life, but they're usually five to six feet across. This is another one of his works um, called Boston. So if you look at the very top, you can see Boston. It's quite small compared to what's underneath it. Um, this one's especially beautiful. I love that curved form in the middle. So artist Jonathan Feldsha brings us out into space and back in time to the birth of the universe. In the same way that the globe is best represented as an oval map, scientific representations of the universe take this oval shape as well. So here we are looking far out into space and thus looking back in time to the birth of the universe or at least a representation of the background radiation that resulted from the cosmos, cosmic force of the Big Bang. But, as you may have already guessed, this color scape is not from science. The artist here has altered NASA photo composites of the radiation to simulate the stereotypical baby blue, baby pink colors we are so familiar with. Felcha, as an artist, is interested in creating, or sorry, interested in using the meaning of color that we all kind of have this psychological idea about. He uses color to relay feeling and relay knowledge and message, something which scientific data often does not employ. This is another piece of his. Um, I just wanted to include it to give you a sense of scale. Scale is another tool that can be used to create intellectual and emotional experiences with science. So sure, this picture isn't literally as big as the universe, but it hints at the, the enormity of what is otherwise kind of difficult to feel. And artist Jody Rash shows us the beauty of what is in real life not a beautiful thing at all, the disease diabetes. And he has other pieces on diseases as well. This piece is called Sweet Diabetes. It allows us to understand diabetes on the levels of its cells, devoid of context and consequence. So visualizing data can give us a different expanded perspective on science. Artist Nathalie Maybach gives sculptural form to weather and weather patterns like hurricanes. What do we know about the weather by viewing her sculptures that we didn't know before? In this example, maybe we haven't learned anything concrete or important in the functional sense, but for me, viewing her work certain, certainly gives me access into the chaotic system which rains and shines on us daily, which otherwise is too large for me to see all at once. Importantly, all of Nathalie's sculptures are coded. They are meti meticulously created to represent data where structure, color, and material choice follow a strict system which corresponds to data points that she uses in all of her work. So she works closely with weather scientists. In this type of work, much of like what you've seen today, it gives us a different kind of knowledge, a more bodily knowledge of the subject matter. Similarly, something as vast and incomprehensible as the weather, here we have a piece about the microbiome, which is very hot today in science. Artist Francois Joseph Lapointe's piece here is called Work Number Two, Becoming Batman Microbiome Selfie, which he says, and I'll explain the title, he says, quote, 
It is constructed from samples of my oral microbiome before and after eating a fruit bat in Guinea, right in the middle of the Ebola outbreak. It's uh, unclear if that's actually true. <laughs> Here, the colors of the network of bacterial DNA sequences represent different microbial communities. This is another one of his called Work Number One Microbiome Triptych Selfie, which was, and I quote, constructed from samples of my gut and oral microbiome collected after eating a burger. The three panels present different visualizations of the same network of bacterial DNA sequences showing the nodes, the links, or the nodes and the links at once. The different colors represent distinct microbiome samples. There is so much we don't know about the microbiome, but through this act of visualization here, we're able to understand it maybe a little bit more. Neurodome is a planetarium show of the brain. It brings us inside the brain, much like a space planetarium show brings us into outer space. So injecting a bit of wonder through its dramatic presentation, Neurodome gives anyone the ability to see the brain as they never have before. They're based here in NYC. You can catch their shows. The founder of Neurodome, scientist Jonathan Fisher, wanted to make the brain feel like an exciting, unexplored frontier. To another frontier, our human genome, here is artist Aimee Ma. She has visualized the CCR5 Delta 32 gene, which is a human gene variant that results in resistance to HIV infection. On the left is the normal gene, on the right is the gene variant. So again, so many things in science are hard to comprehend without a visual aid, and here, even a child is able to understand a bit of what it means to have this gene variant. Visualization can act to spread science and knowledge to those who otherwise would not be able to access it because of age, education level, resources, or disability. Visualizing science can also help us draw attention to issues which are hard to see, relate to. Here we have a, what is a very small portion of a very large project called the Crochet Coral Reef Project, which is currently on view, um, the whole installation at the Museum of Arts and Design. I highly recommend you go see it. Created by artists Margaret and Christine Wertheim, they have used the medium of crochet to represent coral reefs. Crochet naturally lends itself to organic undulating forms, much like coral has. This section specifically speaks to the bleaching of coral, a result of warming waters and climate change, which is startling when compared with what the rest of their work looks like, which is mostly very, very colorful and huge. <laughs> Artist Daisy Patton is raising awareness to endangered species through this flash memory card game where she invited her audience to see if they could remember the species they overturned. And finally, through the act of visualizing science, we can see things we couldn't see in strings of data and maybe learn something new. So biophysicist Jane Richardson is well known for her development of the ribbon diagram, which was first the first successful representation method for showing the 3D structure of folded proteins, which is especially important given that we can't actually see proteins. We can only infer their shape, and how a protein folds and its shape is crucial to understanding our biology and disease. Richardson has long used origami as a metaphor for protein folding and has a personal interest in origami as well. I recently heard her speak about this. Richardson saw the similarity between protein folding and paper folding. Both start as 2D and turn into three-dimensional objects. And this line of thought led her to breakthroughs in the understanding of how the proteins that she was studying could be folded. Similarly, Don Ingber, who's a cell biologist and founding director of the Weiss Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard, started out his career by discovering the role of tensegrity in biology. This is the idea that mechanical forces play as important a role in biological controls as chemicals and genes do. Ingber had this realization while he was studying cellular biology and sculpture side by side as an undergraduate. His sculptures purportedly reminded him of the Bunkmister Fuller tensegrity model, which in turn made him rethink the forces behind cellular structure. More recently, iWire, which is a citizen science brain mapping game that started out at MIT and now is associated with Princeton, 
challenges users, gamers, to map the structure of a neuron through a gaming interface, winning points when a neuron is complete. They have over 200,000 people from 145 countries participating as part of a larger quest to map the brain. Much like mapping the genome, this act of mapping leads to scientific discoveries in itself. In 2014, thanks to the iWire data, some of it, um, we discovered the mechanisms behind a mammal's ability to tell that something it sees is moving. Um, this sounds very simple, and it is, but it's pretty integral to how we operate in the world and how, say, artificial intelligence we develop could operate. Um, and so this knowledge can now be applied to medicine and artificial intelligence. Uh, and lastly, Janet Awasa, a pioneer in molecular animation, makes estimated guesses where the science is lacking, which in turn sparks reactions from scientists, reactions which further inform the research. So these are images, um, they're screenshots from her in-progress animation on how the HIV molecule infiltrates a cell and changes the DNA. Um, so these are some of the types of projects that we feature in SciArt Magazine. Most of those images were from our past three and a half years of publishing. We have an open submission policy, so if anyone in this room um, has something they want to send along to be considered, please email me. We rely on submissions. Um, we also publish topical articles about science and art and society, educating people in cross-disciplinary manners. And this is part of the uh, overall company, SciArt. And uh, just to give you a bit more information about what we do, we host events, we have a collaborative residency program, we have a membership program, um, we represent artists and sell science-inspired art to um, organizations, institutions, individuals. And we're also kind of facilitating this international network of cross-disciplinary individuals. Really, our main goal is to foster a sense of friendship or collaboration or positive interaction between science and art at large. We do this largely through getting scientists and artists together in the same place to hang out, engage in an activity, listen to a speaker, talk about art, talk about science. Our next event, in case you're interested, is on November 30th. Um, it's free and open to the public on the art and science of awareness, so we'll be hearing from artists and scientists on how they approach the topic of awareness through their work and research. And this is all on our website. Um, and uh, I wanted to finish with showing one piece of mine. This is a piece I made called Chemical Play, where I made G-protein coupled receptors out of concrete. Um, <laughs> I made this during college, but I thought you guys might appreciate it. <laughs> uh, so thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>